some stories of daily interaction with the master. We had the privilege and joy to build him a new chalet in Castelrama, which is in the Montagne des Pyrénées. And uh, at one point he came when we were there and lived in the old chalet. So we had interactions with him. And uh, when he moves from one place to the next, he would always for the first few days stay by himself because it said when you move from one place to the next, it takes sometimes a long time for your other finer bodies to follow. So we were building and one day, it was the end of the day, getting dark. We were in uh, the room doing some uh, inside walls and it was pretty messy. You had tools everywhere, sawdust and blah, blah, blah. So Ivanov came in and I thought, great, the master is coming in. I was very excited. I hadn't seen him many times at that time. And I was like, I'm going to hear those big revelations. You know, I was all <laughs> jacked up. <laughs> and he goes, you guys, that's too dirty. You cannot work in those conditions. Do this, do that, put this in place, reorganize. And I was right by him. And I looked at him and I thought, gosh, he looks very irritated in a way. And, uh, you know, his hair kind of not together. And I thought, gosh, you're in presence of a great master. Stop thinking those things. And uh, so I went and he left. And uh, half an hour later, he came back on the site. He was all dressed in white. And I tell you, he was radiant with light. His hair were just fluffy and perfect. He was loving. He was talking to us. And uh, when sometimes he had to be severe, he would always after come back to love. And I remember in this sense, in Bonfin, sometimes we would start the Congress. We worked as uh, permanent with my companion. And uh, the first days he would be like, putting things in place, telling this doesn't work, this doesn't work, you know, the severe side, trying to exorcise all the things to come to a higher level of vibration with him. And after a few days, he would say, oh, assez de la sévérité. <laughs> and uh, he would start giving all his teaching again. Enough of being severe now that uh, maybe hopefully the house is clean and I can do my work. So it was amazing to see, and when I thought something, he came back after, and it was like the armor of light and beauty and goodness and love. So when he says, you know, you always fix things whenever you can. And uh, the other story, which is very touching, I told in our time, you had two young sisters. They were at uh, Castelhama for a while, and they found some wild strawberries in the woods. Very nice ones, very tasty and they went to offer some to the master. And the master was fasting at that time. So knock, knock on the door, he comes to the door and they say, oh, it's for you. And he said, you know, I'm fasting now, I cannot eat the strawberries, but wait a minute. And he disappears and they hear a big commotion in the kitchen. And he comes back with the strawberries and whipped cream on the top of the strawberries. And he said, I cannot eat those now, but you can. And he offered them to them, which is so beautiful. I will never forget that one. And also, we had another time, a brother was shoveling, and Anatole had a similar story. So he was shoveling some dirt and throwing it 20 feet away to level something. Ivanov, the master, came and said, no, 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 you don't do it like this, I'll show you. You bring a wheelbarrow, you take the shovel, you put the soil in the wheelbarrow, and then you go and dump it. And the brother was in some way very fixed in his ideas, and he, he, he didn't want to accept it. And so we all thought, gosh, you know, you are taught by the <laughs> teacher. So we all went kind of on. And Ivanov said, do whatever you want to do, which is not a good thing to hear from a teacher. <laughs> And uh, one day uh, he was walking down uh, the gravel driveway and you had some trees on both sides. And some trees on one side were doing much better than on the other side. 
and I saw him blessing the trees. And uh, at one point I met him and saw him and I said, wow, you know, the blessing on those trees, they look much better than the others. And he looked at me and he said, I don't think that's the right interpretation. <laughs> and all the time, you know, so, so high, so beautiful, but at the same time, so practical. And uh, one uh, beautiful one, we had finally finished the new chalet for him to come in. And of course, right before he came in, in the bathroom, the guy who did the plumbing had crossed hot water and cold water. So with the brother plumber, we tried to fix it. We, we fixed it barely in time and he arrived. And uh, so we were kind of visiting the place with him, which was nice. And at one point you had the southern uh, part of the house and you had a door and Ivanov opened the door. And, you know, the way he moved and his gesture were always ample and always precise, but also graceful. So he opened that door. Suddenly I see the whole landscape on the other side of the door. And it's like seeing the world. And he looks at me and gives me a big smile. It was like as if he opened the door for me on the universe. And the smile he gave me at that moment, I will never forget. That's still in me right now. You have another story, if I can keep on. During the weekends, we had brothers and sisters, a beautiful family coming from Marseille all the way to help during the weekend. Beautiful family. And uh, so we had been working all weekend and it had been, you know, we were just full of enthusiasm. It was sunny, we were just having a great time and also doing it for the master. And uh, it was just amazing. And at night, the brother who was in charge of the construction got in a terrible fight in the refectoire of uh, Castelhama with uh, one of the high guys of uh, Isgrev. And they really fought, it was ugly. But it was mainly the four men who did that. And uh, so it came to be known by Ivanov. And the next day he came to give a lecture. And he gave some lecture and he said then, you know, yesterday was such a beautiful day. I could see the flames coming out of you. You were all so enthusiastic and beautiful. And it was such a beautiful high experience. When this happened at night, it made me sick. We were all woof to see how he's a master, but how he's sensible to whatever happens around him. And uh, after the lecture, he left, and the brother who had gone into the terrible fight stood up and apologized. And he said, I learned the lesson, and I'm very sorry about it. So it was a very intense moment you could, you, that happened there. One day in Bonfin, I was working in the reception and we had had many people coming in and it was noon, it was the time for the lecture. And at noon you have the bells going ding dong, ding dong, it means everybody is waiting in silence on the uh, ground for the exercises. So I was late, I was closing the reception, but from there I could see the avenue from the chalet of the master and it was one of those days in Bonfin of Mistral, when the wind blows, the air is so clear, the blue is bluer than blue, a few white clouds, and you had the rocks of the Esterel behind, these red rocks that I love so much, and the green of the trees and the oleanders blooming. And uh, I saw this white figure walking from his gate toward the exercise. And he was walking and praying, and when he walks, going to the Grand Salle, he's praying. And I mean, he becomes bigger than life. He was not tall in the physical plane, but everybody who just saw a picture thought that he was tall because he had such a presence. And he was walking and praying, and it was like a dance. And you could feel the whole universe moving with him, all the elements and uh, everything. And at the same time, he was moving with the whole universe. And I'll never forget either that moment. 
you can have some moments that last for a few seconds, but when that's quality and a divine quality, and you could see a heaven on earth. And once I wrote to him when I was all young and enthusiastic, and I'm still, <laughs> for me to see him was like seeing God walking in his creation. You know, as a theologian, it was like seeing finally things the way they should be. And uh, he read the letter at one point and he said, Ce théologien m'a touché le cœur, et ma vengeance sera terrible. And the cœur, you know, that's the, the main thing. He said, il exagère. <laughs> toujours l'humour, toujours simplicité, toujours l'humilité. Il exagère, mais ce qui compte, il m'a touché le cœur. Et c'était quelque chose pour moi, le, cet enseignement révèle tout, le, comme j'ai dit, du, du commencement à la fin, mais avec toutes les étapes intermédiaires. On peut avoir un but, mais pour ce but, nous avons chacun un voyage différent. Et il donnait à chacun la possibilité de... Et des fois, il, il était sévère avec moi, mais pas trop, parce que je suis peut-être trop sensible ou pas assez fort pour prendre ces, <rire> ces engueulades quand c'est nécessaire. Ça m'arrivait une fois. <rire> mais après, j'avais fait une, quelque chose de stupide. Et il la, la chose principale qu'il m'a dit, qu'il m'a dit, vous êtes bête, vous n'avez aucun sens de l'esthétique, pourquoi avez-vous ces choses comme ça Et après, il a dit, mais maintenant, reprenez votre travail, reprenez vos prières. Continuer, la seule chose qui compte, c'est de se relever, de travailler, de continuer. On reçoit sa, sa leçon, mais allez, au travail, au travail, au travail. <laughs> My name is François Cerf, which means Frank Deer, if you translate in a weird way in the United States. And the Deer means surf in French. And... Uh, So, Lavanchi called me Le Pasteur for one good reason, because before coming to Bonfin, I had studied theology. But when I was studying theology, I was doing it for idealistic reason, to find spiritual life. I knew there was something amazing in there, in the traditions, and uh, I couldn't find it in the church. So I had a kind of a long walk about from 72, where I studied for one year in the United States, in a very nice, open-minded Christian seminary, which was very amazing, in uh, near Minnesota, in, near Minneapolis. And I came back in Europe, and I was really out of sync between my search, between countries, between cultures, And uh, really, my, my soul was hurting. And uh, I was looking and looking, trying different things, different meditations. So I was in the search in faith, the in-between world, which is not pleasant at all, as you all know. And uh, so I tried different things, met different people. And uh, when I was 25, my brother died in the uh, mountains in an uh, accident in the army, a very stupid thing, but karmic too. And uh, when I saw my brother's body, after he passed away, I was with my mother and I really knew that something had gone out of the body and what was left was not my whole brother his physical body was behind, but it was so clear that the element that brings life was, was gone. And so I was still uh, looking around, I was not able to put things back together, and I went to this Italian healer, Francesco Racanelli, who was an amazing man, who had a gift for healing, he had had a very hard life, very poor when he was young, like all the great beings he had been tried many times and uh, he was promoting what is called the uh, medicine of life and uh, he would know about being you could talk to him on the phone and he knew what you were who you were what you had done and everything but he was also the most humble amazing person so in some way it was the first block going away And uh, then I had a friend who was reading the master's book and I read some and we were going for walks in the evening and talking about it. 
And uh, one day, uh, a guy I had known in the church when I was in the youth church, I met him in the post office, uh, Jean Garrigue, and he said to me, you have to come to the teaching. That's for you. <laughs> Thank you, Jean. So I read more and I asked, and uh, a few weeks later, I was in Vidinata and you had a congress there, and I met the master. I had a rendezvous for the first time, and he really puzzled me. You know, he said, Vous êtes arrivé dans une école de perdition. And my eyes, like big knives, were going big. Then he started laughing and he said, You are going to lose all your vices, all your weaknesses, and everything. <laughs> and I started laughing too. <laughs> And uh, he, he did also, you know, you were in the school of weakness, you were in the school of weakness, now you are going to go in the school of strength. But it was very funny when he saw my eyes go like, wow, he had this way of uh, taking you by surprise and opening some new dimensions. And uh, then I was in a group in Chamblon, which was uh, near Yverdon in Switzerland. And a very nice, very lively group, and they had a garden. We would meet in the weekends, listen to some lectures, and wonderful people. It was just great. And in a meeting, uh, rendezvous with the master during the summer congress of 76, I said, oh, master, thank you. I can be in such a great, lovely place. They are doing such a good job. And he said, not for long. You won't, won't be there very long. And then a few weeks after that, I was permanent in Bonfin. <laughs> and uh, we had to go to the chalet of the master, and Lavanchi was with us. And the uh, master said, what can he do? You know, question practically. And at that time, I tell you, I couldn't do very many practical things. And Lavanchi said, he can do anything. <laughs> he turned around, and it was OK. And so in, uh, at the end of summer, I started in the Bonfin for two and a half years. That's where I met Anatole, who many, many years later, 2021, is here recording me and looking at me smiling. <laughs> Life is good. The teacher, master, Omran Mikhail Ivanov, I met when I was 26, in so many ways answered all my questions about life. I had been studying theology and uh, literature and spirituality and was on my journey or my search. And when I met that teaching, suddenly everything became clear. And not only on a philosophical level, on a theological level, but uh, on a human dimension too. And uh, he gives you all the explanation, all the methods, all the means to realize life. And his teaching is all about life, plenitude of life, joy of life, fullness of life. And uh, if you have to reach that goal, you have in one way to bring the divide into the human side and on the other way to clarify the human side, to purify what is called the lower self, to be able to reach the higher and then bring again the higher side into the lower side. And in his teaching, you have the perfect balance between material and spiritual, between all the dimensions of life. And he not only tells you about it, but he shows you how to do it. And uh, when you were around him, you knew that he was a, the perfect incarnation of what he was teaching. It was a beautiful experience. It's like watching the weather. You have all the different moods, the clouds, the sun, and everything. And he could reflect all the different moods of life. And when he had to be very severe with us sometimes because we were kind of off track, he would do it, but always with love. And sometimes he was just so enchanting and full of lightness and joy and humor. And he would show you all the different sides of life. At one point, somebody saw behind him in India, Shiva, and you had Durga and Lakshmi, the two principles. The one, Durga is the severe one, like the severe mother, and Lakshmi is the beauty and the goodness. And Omra Mikhailovanov was the perfect balance between the two principles. He was able to use them both. 
but every time he was talking or teaching, it was always to help us grow, to help us realize things, to help us reach more. He could be hard, he could be absolutely delightful, but it was always pedagogy. It was always to teach something. And uh, he was doing it all the time with so much grace and so much sacrifice. I heard a quote a few days ago. I don't know if that's the right way of putting it, but it might have been from Jimi Hendrix. And he said, when the love of power will be replaced by the power of love, then a new age will come. Something else will be realized. And the highest thing is the power of love. And if you take in the Kabbalah Keter, the highest one, it is the power of love and sacrifice. And Ivanov was the perfect example of sacrifice. He was a very high being and uh, he incarnated and he had to put up with us <laughs> and with a lot of things. And he never stopped. He kept on going for 49 years. He prepared himself for 37 years with all the sacrifices too. And uh, in spite of all that we put in his way, he was able to just keep on giving the message and also to bring the message to the future generation. He was one of the highest, if not the highest beings that came on earth. You know that you have different epochs and you had the time of Moses, a lot of times before, and the time of Jesus. And now we are going into what is called the age of Aquarius. And he was introducing the age and preparing us for it. And which is just the continuation of the work. And he told us that times changes, it might be the same principles, but we have to adapt our ways of working and the teaching to a new epoch. And the new epoch is coming. It will take time, but he gave us the principles, as I said, the means, the methods. And what is amazing about him, he always speaks in images. So there is nothing abstract about it. That's connected to life. And in a way, the center of the teaching, the cruise, the cross, is the 24 hours. How to live fully every day. And when we live fully every day, it leads to the next one and to the next one. And uh, he showed us how to be conscious, how to be respectful, how to be loving, how to share, how to live on a higher plane and bring this higher plane into the lower plane. As above, so below. His whole teaching for me was opening the connection between all the worlds. And it's, it is a universal teaching in the sense that it contains everything. But it contains everything in a way you can digest it because he gave us the daily food. And the daily meditations we are taking are a good way to connect with it. Then we can see more, read more, and so on, but always stay connected. What is needed today? And in his lecture, sometimes he would have to reveal certain things, but he knew it was not the time, or we were not ready to listen to it. So he could wait and see when he would get the green light because he's a teacher, but he is also a servant of the higher worlds. And he was always listening to it and not pushing his own agenda on us or on people. He was just a transparent channel and a beautiful one. And it's an amazing sacrifice. Some people uh, say that Jesus brought the principles Peter Dunoff, his teacher, brought the methods and he's bringing the realization. And the realization is just shows us in every aspect of life how we can spiritualize things. And his teaching is all about how you can bring spirit into matter and how you can spiritualize the spirit. It's all about connecting, balancing under, you know, the idea of love and sacrifice. It's not about myself, not about yourself, it's about the light. And uh, he proved it every day, every time. I saw him in many situations and it reminded me of uh, 
wise Italian guy. He was a healer. I met in Italy and he helped me a lot before I met the teaching. And he said, you know, with people, I am like, if somebody is a piano, I play the piano. If somebody is a guitar, I play the guitar. If somebody is a trombone, I play the trombone. And it meant by that that he was not there for himself either. He was there to help people on their journey toward perfection. And uh, another great sister in the brotherhood who was a great healer in the true sense of the world said, I'm just a garden hose. <laughs> and I like the attitude, the humility. She was not owning that power of healing. She was letting it through her. And uh, she was an amazing being. And all those amazing beings are humble. They have a great sense of humor about themselves. And what they do, they do it for us and not for themselves. So meeting him, I saw him in so many different situations. And uh, he was always different, always kind, always loving. But he would say what had to be said at the right time. And he was in that sense like a Zen master. When you meet a master, you don't have preconceptions or ideas. You just try to open up to what's going on. And the same with the teaching. We must leave behind our preconceptions and open up what is coming through. So a great thing too is he talked a lot about I am the way, I am the truth, I am uh, love. Uh, I don't say it right right now, but he meant that wisdom is the bed of the river. Love is the water that flows through it. And truth is the source. And uh, his teaching in the beginning was all about wisdom, love, and truth. And uh, he presented it in many ways. And it brings me back to the Gospels that Ivanov could open up to us like nobody else because he would take precise examples. He could talk about the symbols. He could talk about the ideas and make it crystal clear. And he said, my teaching is simple. That's why maybe some people don't take it seriously because he could solve all the great problems with the very few simple images. And uh, I extrapolate here, but he opens up the way. If you take a person like Einstein, he tells you EMC square. You think EMC square, everybody can use it? No, we know about the ID, but the scientists who work every day at every minute to use it will be able to unlock the mystery or EMC square. The teaching and Ivanov are giving you, giving us some formula, some prayers, some methods, but it's up to us to open it up. If we don't practice, if we don't put all our heart and minds every day in it, it will stay like a closed book. Ivanov showed us, opened up the book and shows us read. He's a teacher. And uh, once we can read, we can, with our own faculties, recreate, think like the way he thought, feel what he felt. And uh, we can become ourselves a source of life. That's the whole thing. And he always insisted that the main thing is our work and work, work, work. He can give us anything. And in his teaching, I'm not here to give you this and that. He just said, that's like, I am putting all the foods on the table and then it's up to you to take the food that takes you to the goal. The center, the goal is the same for all of us, but we all have different personalities, different karma, different background. And in his teaching, you find it all. And he said, one day I'm going to write the third testament. It seems presumptuous. You know, you have the Old Testament, the New Testament, and he's bringing the third one. And uh, he said, one day I'm going to write a little book and it will go through the whole world. And uh, we can think he didn't write it. He passed away before, but all that he said, all his books, everything, that's it. 
and uh, that's presented in a way that can be digested. That's not uh, read or digest and so on. That's a fully alive teaching. We go back to, I was telling, Jesus said, I am the way. We can see it in the sense of Jesus is the light and so on. But it means I am is the way. I am is the truth. I am is the life. And it's the same with the teaching like Ivanov. He opens up a way for everybody. Everybody can become what he is in the sense can live the same fullness of life the same sharing, the same spirit of sacrifice. It's not a guru. There's not a God in the sense of he's the only one who can do that. But he was such an advanced being that he could open up the way. And once the way is open, it's for everybody to be followed, to be integrated. And uh, what counts is the life that we do in following him. Greetings to everybody who's listening. We send through time and space our best light and we are all connected. So in somewhere time does not exist. It is just a carrier of something else. So practical stories too. At one point, the master needed a new line cable for uh, his TV in his chalet. So we had to go from La Grande Salle to his chalet, which is quite a long way. And uh, I was in charge and I thought, oh, you have to bury it. And I was starting to dig a trench and the trench about this deep. And it would have taken forever. And Ivanov came and said, don't do that. It takes much too much time. Just put it in the oleanders along the way, protect it maybe in something. And then you just dig under the road here and that's done. Always practical. And uh, one day I was still working on that line and uh, it went, uh, the call for a lecture at noon was, uh, so you hear the bell going on. And so everybody has to be out of the way because he's doing his work coming to the lecture. And like a big dummy, I was still installing something. He came out of his chalet sooner than I thought. So I ducked into the shrub, but of course he saw me. And I thought, oh my. <laughs> so after the lecture, I was back to work on this and he came and he apologized. He said, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I cannot greet you and I'm doing my work. I didn't want to be rude, blah, blah, blah. And I said, master, that's me. I should not have been there. And uh, I'm very, you know, sorry about that. It's, <laughs> but he gave the apology and I'm the one who did the most stupid thing. It's just, just amazing. Another story related to Bonfin. We had two sisters we liked very much. One of them was a very gifted artist, dancer, creator. And uh, she was thinking of going to Dornach the anthroposophy to learn Eurythmy, the dance. And she asked for a rendezvous with the master. And uh, the master received her. And she was a very strong, amazing lady. We called her the queen of Africa. So she had such a presence, even if she was born in Geneva. And uh, the master just told her, why are you trying to go there? You have everything in the teaching. And why would you? do that, just focus on blah, blah, blah. And when she came out, she was like <laughs> big eyed too. And uh, you know, it shakes you to the core of your being. And uh, she followed the advice. And uh, so you can think, oh, wow, no going to the Steiner teaching and this is not so good. Another sister, a wonderful sister from South Africa, and uh, he told her at one point, go to Dornach, work there, learn Rudolf Steiner teaching, work with them, 
that's your path. And she went there and now she is doing an amazing work. So when you hear stories about the master, don't think that's an absolute truth when it is related to people. He gives the principles in the lectures, but all the practical things too. But sometimes one thing is addressed to one person. Even when he is giving a lecture for 500 people, it could be targeted to a certain type of situation or certain type of person. So it was interesting to see. We could think that's a complete contradiction, but no. It's why he's above good and evil in the sense of he's using the different sides of life always toward perfection. And it was a very practical way of seeing it. Behind us, we have a kind of a sculpture that's a piece of cotton wood, which is in the family of the poplar, very common in the Southwest. It's a very hard wood, so you cannot really use it to burn. It's not a good wood. And uh, all the veins are crossed. And a friend with a chainsaw made this sculpture. And she didn't know what to do with it. And so she gave it to Barbara. And to me, it looks like coming out of the cocoon. It looks like a flame. It looks like resurrection, elevation. And uh, all that the master says about the transformation from the caterpillar to a butterfly is in the sculpture from the bottom to the top. So every time, every day when I see it, I, I am very inspired. Yeah. And uh, so I also always wanted, uh, in a different way, I studied theology. I tried to read Rudolf Steiner when I was in my search. And I knew it was very interesting in this and that, but I could not digest it. I knew it was great. I could not make it my own. So I had the teaching, and one after years of reading and practicing the teaching of Ivanov, suddenly the teaching of Steiner opened up. So Ivanov brought me to Steiner, and Steiner brings me to Ivanov. You see how all the great teachers work together. And Rudolf Steiner is the one who said, after me, somebody is coming who will be more clear than me and have the life. And he was, he talked a lot about the age of Michael, but you shouldn't say Michael. Rudolf Steiner was very angry when somebody said Michael. He said, Mikael, because in Hebrew, that's who is like God. And you know, the master explains the whole story. So we are going from the Christ principle to the Mikael principle. And Rudolf Steiner and Omra Mikhail Ivanov are both the great spirits who introduce us, who open the new epoch, who bring us towards something new. On some levels, Ivanov is all life and practical. And uh, on some level, Steiner can give you the background. Ivanov gives you the life. And then when you need the explanation, Ivanov is not there for going into details and this and that. You can, you can find it with the key of the teaching, with the life of the teaching. So to me, they are in a funny Bible image. It's like John the Baptist and the Christ. John the Baptist prepared the way, and then the Christ come. And in the 20th century, you had those great beings, Rudolf Steiner, and then Omra Mikhail Ivanov. Rudolf Steiner finished his mission in 1925, and then Ivanov, for 49 years, did his own work. And what's amazing about it, you have to read in Steiner about the Christ, and Jesus was able Jesus received the Christ being, which is the solar being, which is the whole teaching, when he was 30. And uh, until then, it was Jesus preparing himself to receive that potent spirit. He received it, but a human body cannot hold it more than, Steiner said, three years before, <laughs> basically, you know, exploding or dissolving in the universe. Ivanov received that spirit when he was 37 and held it for 49 years. <laughs> and uh, 
it was a different time. The mankind was not the same. People didn't live on the same level, but it's an absolute amazing also sacrifice. We, we cannot imagine the sacrifice of those higher beings coming into, yeah. into life yeah. and having to, to work with us. So it was absolutely amazing. So that friend who was sent to Dornach, she has a way of saying, Ivanov is my master and Steiner is my teacher. And I think it's a very good way to do it. And Anatole reminded me that on education, for instance, Steiner has amazing things. And Ivanov just said in a lecture, just go and read what, what's there. So he knew about that, and it was not his job to give you all those things. He was just bringing us to the main points. And also about the synergy, the new order for society. Steiner in the threefold social order goes into details you cannot imagine, into agriculture, into uh, health, medicine, in all those four elements. In this way, he gives the way to incarnate it. And Ivanov brings you to that, but without Ivanov, you don't have the inner, in some way, joy, life, exuberance that allows you to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's completely uh, complementary, those two mm -hmm. things. It's absolutely amazing because they both work for <laughs> the higher world. Mm -hmm.